está. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. This is the last um, talk council uh, of the municipal year. Plenty of business to get through, so I appreciate people with the new gravity uh, whether they possibly can. <coughs> Uh, first, I to my on the agenda of declarations of interest, or the uh, declaration of interest. We have to consider whether any disclosed, disclosed or accumulate or any other relevant interest in connection with matters to be determined at this meeting. If so, be clear and say the nature of such an interest. Now, might get, if you could just mention the item and the item number, that would be most helpful for the minutes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Steve Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, agenda item. Case uh, by virtue of my ambition of the site by the rectal authority. And this motion number one by virtue of being the one council and one the area. Okay. Uh, Dinesh? I think it's similar. Um, <coughs> agenda item 11, which is a motion to create a declaration. very grateful for the, for the um, administrations at, at Broadway, but he's 
demanded how I do this, that, the other. Okay, I'm sure we, we all pass on our regards to the day. The next one is, uh, I suppose it, it's good for them, but sad for us. Um, two uh, elected members have announced that they are retiring uh, from the council and will not be seeking re election. Uh, first uh, and long serving is, is Councillor Harry Smith, obviously uh, known for his long service. <laughs>
this is, without doubt, uh, a big highlight. It's, uh, as I never told you, I've just held one cup, and that's probably the nearest I'll get to it. And we have been in receipt of, of another, another trophy. Uh, so I'm delighted to inform Council that at the annual Local Government Chronicle Awards held in London last Wednesday, Will Council won the most improved council for 2015. Yeah. The award.
I've spoken to you throughout the year, you've, you've enjoyed every minute of it, minutes of all of it, and have got some fantastic memories. So certainly from, um, from my group, and I'm sure these, these sentiments are shared by all members, uh, can I thank you both most sincerely uh, for a fantastic year, uh, and I know you've got a great event coming up in the, in the summer as well. Um, so I would like to wish you all the best for your, uh, you, you know, for that as well. Uh, but sincerely, from, from everybody, from everybody, I'm sure in, in the chamber, um, a big thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your service. <laughs>
regardless of party, we were going to entrust you with the job. And I have to say that you that that trust has been rewarded by the warmth which you've shown to organisations and the determination that you've shown in supporting your charities. It was evident at the event I went for the Wirral War dinner last week, where again you were able to tell us about the North End, the really lovely warm place it can be, and some of the things you said about some of the people and characters that you've met there. But Mr. Mayor, I think we are being very pleased and honoured to have you in the service of this borough, and again, along with the other leaders, I wish you and Elaine the all the happiness that is going to come from the event in the summer, and wish you well for the future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.
expenses for such journeys may in 2014-15 will be included next time as the annual list of published spending. Thank you for your question, John. The Council's Members Allowance Scheme is detailed in Part 6 of the Constitution and Paragraph 8A deals with travel costs. I'm sure you already know that. The roles and personal circumstances of members um, vary widely, as do the demands and expectations of their constituents, and this has to be borne in mind uh, considering the doing the work that the members do. Uh, some members, for various reasons, have good reason to use taxes uh, in order to carry out some of their approved duties. It's the responsibility of those members concerned to determine when to use a taxi, and in doing so, <coughs> members are trusted to make a judgment <coughs> that is consistent with the members' allowance scheme. In members in exercising that judgment will take account of a number of factors, um, such as the public information <coughs> available at a particular time in question, including the frequency of service, the length of time between connections, <coughs> and the consequent time it will take to get to and from their destination. Uh, this is also balanced against other factors, including personal and family circumstances, other conflicting commitments, including a member's employment, other engagements and appointments to be attended that day, and also um, safety issues, health and safety issues that may arise at a particular time, uh, such as the late night uh, travel and adverse weather conditions. The Council has negotiated um, competitive prices and entered into contracts with the local taxi company to provide transport for members in accordance with the members' allowances scheme. The taxi company submits its invoices and the details of the members who use the taxis each month directly to the council for payment. The advantage of this arrangement is that the cost of transport uh, by taxis is always at the negotiated rate and is a more efficient way to manage the service. Um, these costs have not been published on an annual basis previously. However, in the future, the cost of members taxi journeys undertaken pursuant to these uh, taxi contracts will be published on the council website as soon as practical after the end of each financial year. I will just add, John, that um, I have doubt that in targeting your question to the use of taxis, you may be thought to have missed the big picture, as the use of private cars is also charged to the public purse. I'm not surprised that we'll be on one side of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we allowed to have some of that? You want to? Okay. okay. Well, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Jones. Uh, the information about the cost of taxi journeys made by some councillors was provided to me on the 23rd of January 2015 in response to a freedom of information about the quest. Since that time, I have made four further FOI requests that have not been answered at all within the statutory 20 days, but further six has not been responded to, and only this morning I received an email from the Information Commission's Office that said they will be drafting a decision notice about the Council's failure to respond to an internal review request that was made on the 12th of November last year. Will you apologise tonight for the way in which the Council is ignoring my request made in the Freedom of Information legislation and send me a written answer before the elections in May as to what is happening to improve your Council?
fields as far as I'm concerned. Am I right? Deals with item five. Now moving on to item six, which is the uh, 41 to 74 agenda containing reports from the leader and cabinet members, chairs of the policy performance coordinating committee. Uh, the cabinet is invited to note these reports and that's the uh, cabinet portfolio holder will not present their reports, which will be, will be taken as well. All questions must be confined to the contents of the reports. Questions, please ensure your questions are long and serious. <coughs> Total number of questions on any one report should not exceed five. Responses to the questions will be received to the conclusion of all the questions on a particular report. Cabinet members, please ensure responses do not exceed ten minutes. So the first, um, now on advance notice, a uh, question has been given from Councillor Gilchrist in respect of the leader's portfolio. Uh, and of course have been supplement taken the supplementary agenda. Councillor Gilchrist, do you want to ask your question? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This paragraph of the report refers to matters relating to the tunnels, which members have before them on page 41. So I'm looking at the paragraph as such. But in connection with that paragraph, can the leader advise, is this work looking into how the tunnel surface has been used in recent years? And secondly, if and how the Mersey ferry operations have been supported out of the surplus? And thirdly, the status of any understanding that surpluses have been spent on transportation schemes of mutual benefit? And if so, might these be drawn together for the projects listed for the information of members? I think Councillor Davis to be black. Yeah, and um, can I thank Councillor Gilchrist for written notice of this question? And, and clearly, as you, as you say, um, uh, the, the combined authority meeting on the 13th of February, um, we, we did agree to uh, set up a, a test group to look at these issues in more in more detail and to uh, to really try and uh, have a completely kind of fresh look, if you like, at the, the whole financing. Of the, uh, of the Mersey tunnels, um, issues like debt, and um, particularly, obviously, the, um, the, the, toll, the tolling policy, um, and to report back to the combined authority uh, as soon as possible. Uh, in terms of the specific issues, the three issues that um, you've raised, Phil, um, my, my response is the terms of reference for this task group and this review are still being finalised, but I will. Um, I will give a commitment now to ensure that the three areas of, of work that you've asked for further information on are included as part of the review and that when um, the, uh, the final report is produced, I'll make sure that the points that he's asked for further information about are covered in the final report, which will clearly, as well as being shared with the uh, Commander Authority, I will make sure are, are shared with all members of, of this council. Okay, are there any further questions which councillors wish to ask in respect of the leader's report? I've got Phil Pipewell, Stu, Kelly, and the Okay, I'll ask you first, Phil. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Will the leader of the council join me in congratulating all staff, councillors, and partners in Wirral with the award of the most improved council of the year at the local and awards last week? That's good. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask the leader about the city region's rail strategy. The package 10 of the uh, rail strategy deals with the borderlands and uh, line enhancements and its three components frequency, electrification, and new stations. However, when I look at the timeline for the enhancements over uh, the next uh, 20 years or so, there was no mention of new stations at Beachwood and at Woodchurch. Would the leader agree uh, that of the three components that make up the borderlands enhancements, surely that uh, new stations must be the number one priority, followed probably by education, because of education without getting the improved uh, frequency um, uh, that we're looking for. Will you undertake to revisit uh, this element of the rail strategy with colleagues in the city region so that we can get a rail strategy that does meet the needs of the uh, residents of the central states as well? Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, my question for the leader of the council, council comes over the <coughs> item two, corporate and financial planning. Um, when cabinet agreed to close the emergency control room last year, eleven lawyer and experienced staff were made redundant on the ground that the emergency control room um, would be closing. And as one senior officer told me, you can take 
understand as loyal and experienced staff believe they have no choice um, as the control room was to be shut. And the position of the emergency control, central control officer was terminated on the 31st of March 2014. The facts are very different. The control room never closed and the position of the emergency central control officer has been carried out by other staff. It's a secondary role and continues to this day. In fact, I phoned with myself this morning. I would ask the leader of the council, why did you make 11 loyal and experienced staff redundant on the premise of closing the emergency control room? Then, nearly 12 months later, agreed a £209,000 budget to keep it open. Who made the initial decision to close the emergency control room when the service was deemed essential months previously? Will you be contacting former staff to apologise for your mistake and offer them their jobs back within the very much open emergency control room? Who made the decision to reinstate CCTV monitoring? Why wasn't the income from service level agreements attributed to the emergency control room as considering closure? And having convinced staff into believing their jobs would no longer be there when they clearly are, have the council followed the correct legal procedures? Finally, and within the two minutes, yeah. as it has been widely known that CCTV is not monitored during the last 12 months, would the leader of the council agree that the rise in crime in specific areas in the world, not least in Birkenhead, that he is responsible for this increase? Okay, that's that short question. <laughs> Thank you. 
I mean, the establishment of a portfolio for improvement in governance in 2012 was a key message from the administration that governance was a key issue for us and that we were going to have a cabinet portfolio for us. The regular monthly cabinet reports that we take on our financial health um, are also another issue where you know we have regular check and balance on uh, the financial health of the authority. Clearly having a very clear corporate plan with clear, clear corporate priorities um, also. Regularly, um, I regularly take key issues in my portfolio against the corporate risk register on, on what are the, the key risks for us at any one time. So every month I take three key risks and we examine them and go over them and I take regular reports back on progress against them before reports are prepared to go to audit risk. Clearly these are all issues which have been mainstreamed and clearly when in looking at that was for an improved council award, um, you know, the, the panels wanted to be very clear that we had in place appropriate governance arrangements, that we mainstreamed them within our organisation and that we've shown evidence that we can sustain them into the future. So thank you very much, yes, they are all key issues, but they are um, the ones that are contained in my report are only a number of of uh, key ones that we look at on a regular basis. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, uh, it's now invited to note that report. Is that agreed? Agreed. We now move on to the cabinet portfolio of neighbourhoods, housing and engagements. Are there any questions for Councillor? Can I just give an interest in terms of cost, quality, plus policy, because I'm on the chair's board. Thank you. 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 This is one of those um, <laughs> interesting <laughs> points, declaration, declaration of interest. Um, I don't believe that I can influence the agenda in any way, shape, or form by simply being present with a question and asked. I will declare uh, an opportunity interest or whether the correct term is as a, as a uh, board member of the agenda. And Stuart, is that likewise? And um, Councillor Denise Roberts, okay? I think I think it might might be more Jeff's taking you well on within the board, so it might be more yes. attractive to Jeff. Yeah. But is that sufficient? We are legal if we do those big declarations. Okay, are there any questions of George? Okay, that's uh Amari Smith, clear about what we call it. I know I'd like counsel to know that before. Is that agree? Okay. Moving on, we now move on to uh Cabinet portfolio of central support services. Any questions to Councillor Amy Jones? <coughs> yes, Christine Spriggs, um, Matt Daniel, and um, Councillor Blake. Uh, three, okay. Take it in that order then. Matt, Christina, and um, Councillor Blake, okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. So Matt. Um, just a, a quick question on um, asset management. Um, can Councillor Jones please bring us up to date on how much the Council has brought in in terms of money through asset disposal? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, this question is around ICT. It's in three parts uh, for Councillor Jones. On your asset management report, uh, can I draw attention first to a problem on Friday afternoon uh, when a number of staff and members were unable to use their mobile phones for emails? Um, how might you use this to prepare uh, again? Um, and secondly, will you comment on why our present computers automatically go off after 15 minutes and we have to re enter our usernames and passwords because we're locked out? And finally, the third bit of my question will you explain why it is now so difficult to retrieve old emails since going off Office 2013 and not Office 2010? Thank you. <laughs>
into into um, uh, file of her own. It's not weak. It's easier than people can do. Well, I mean, I know that it's when, when somebody on the fringe is um, experienced, that's the question. <laughs>
please look at it and see if we can't put this right. It doesn't seem to me to be beyond the wit of man to correct this one, because people are getting extremely upset about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to talk briefly on that one live um, The cabinet member will be aware that on Christmas Eve, an email went out to all staff and users saying, um, dictating to them what hour their library will be open. But I'd like to thank the cabinet member for the 11th hour intervention and consultation that did take individual library needs into account. However, some French groups are anxious, and this follows on from my distinguished colleagues' um, question, which is, the various activities are, are taking place in libraries that are not on scheduled opening hours and I understand there's a volunteer agreement in the process of being drawn up. That hasn't yet been done and various library users are concerned that we'll be held on history talks with the baby bounce and round take place in a few weeks. So we'll have a number expedite this to ensure that the great work that the libraries do and the library friends do can carry on. Thank you. Okay, and I'd like to ask to respond. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my, um, to your question, I, I don't have an answer with me now, but I will look into that and get a written letter answer to you and um, include the rest of the councillors if that's acceptable to you. And Tom, thank you, first of all, for your kind words. Um, yes, I will look into that as well for you tomorrow, and um, I will find out what's going on and give you a written reply as well. Thank you. Okay. And now, in my council to the Democratic Boss, that's me. Yeah. And now on to the Cabinet Portfolio for the Economy, given to Councillor Pat Hackett. Are there any questions for Councillor Pat Hackett? Dave Mitchell. And that's it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's in relation to the town centre really, but I've been in my time on the council. This is now the third attempt at trying to revitalise the town centre. But will the Cabinet member explain how we expedite it this time to get a true answer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll, I'll just be brief. I'm mindful of it. It's a long life. Um, the first stage uh, of, the list of the master plan has now been submitted by Neptune Developments, um, which is the subject of the report that went to Canvas uh, last last Thursday. The plan, Mr Mayor, identifies that there's an opportunity to develop both the central and retail core and the leisure retail offer in their next hand centre to enhance the fourth floor of the centre and significantly improve the prospect of the town for future investment across a range of services. Um, you will know uh, that the plan uh, identifies how the leisure sector has emerged from the recession in a far stronger position than the equivalent retail business and demand uh, from leather operators and, 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 and demand so from leather operators is generally, generally strong. Can I just say the, 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 the plan, the, the, first, the first part of the plan envisages, as you know, moving your open pool to the, to, to the site behind the, um, uh, the station and, and, and bringing in restaurants around the, uh, <coughs> the, the cinema. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a plan that's worth in New Brighton, but it's only the first phase of, of a bigger plan, obviously, and it's out for consultation, and it will be out for consultation to the trade unions, obviously, businesses and residents, and, and, and there'll be a full consultation. Um, you know, it, 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 it's up to the members, uh, the members, it's up to the members of the board, residents, businesses, trade unions, to, to, to agree or disagree with it. Certainly, going back on the point, it went through many phases, many revisions over a 10 year period before we got to this stage where, where, where we could agree on it and even got knocked back as we know by the government at the time. So it, it is early days. Um, it, it, it's a plan I think that, that it, it, it's worth really considering, you know. And, and of course the next stage is to look at the market and other aspects of the town centre. And really, you know, as, as I said off on last Thursday, uh, this is crying out for regeneration. It, 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 it's a plan that will bring thousands of jobs and bring big operators, big big names back to their net. And, and, you know, and, and let's face it, at the moment, Bitmet is the premier retail, um, <coughs> premier retail um, centre in the, in the whole of the world. I hope that answers your question for now, Dave. Councillor Green wants to ask you a question. You have said it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and it is, it is related directly to that particular issue <coughs> uh, past uh, for you, Mr. Bear. Talking about the Burkhead Town Centre and the 
market and um, have a linkage as well. I'm, I'm sure other colleagues will be aware. The situation of the market, Royal Charter, and how far you can ride on a horse in eight hours or whatever, has impacted on some of the farmers' markets that people have tried to set up locally with local growers and producers and so on. In this consultation that we're having with, uh, with Neptune, etc., about the central purpose. I think it's a, it's a real opportunity to look at that again to try and foster those farmers' markets. And I just wonder whether the cabinet members will be prepared to take that on board in those discussions. Yeah, I mean, just, just briefly, you know, the answer to that. I mean, we're looking at every aspect of, of the operation of the market in the next phase. So that's something that we'll be taking on board. And, and, you know, I mean, it has to stop if you have any farmers' markets, as I said, but I understand your concerns. Okay, those concerns are saying that our members are not having questions from the market. So let me leave it with the leader. Um,
Um, can I just very briefly, Mr. Mayor, deal with uh, the uh, amendments? I mean, I, I think the, um, the arguments have been well rehearsed over the uh, Chief of the XRE um, at, the, uh, at the previous council meeting. If you look at all the uh, comparator authorities um, in the northwest, um, it is certainly not out of kilter with the, uh, the median salary for a uh, chief executive in a metropolitan council, which is 174,000. Uh, if you look at some of our near neighbours, um, uh, just to give you a few examples, um, Nosley, 160,000. Um, Tory controlled Cheshire West, 180,000. Tory controlled Cheshire East, 187,000. Um, St. Helens, 100,000. 40,000, those the 160,000, Liverpool, nearly 200,000. So I, I believe it is, um, you know, I, I do accept it is a uh, special amount of money, but I think uh, given the market that we were in, um, I don't believe we would have got the uh, calibre of candidate that we have in Mr. Mr. Robinson, Mr. Eric Robinson, if we had have, uh, left the, uh, the summary unchanged. So that, do, do believe that that was the, the, the right decision, as difficult though it is in the current um, financial climate. But do we want the best um, person that, that, that we can get for this crucial post in terms to, to, of to taking the council forward um, uh, over the next uh, five, ten years? I, I believe we, we, um, we, we do need to recognise that that is the, uh, the going rate of these things. Uh, in terms of the, um, the, the amendments, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll be, I'll be recommending to Council that we reject both amendments uh, in terms of the Chief of Tech salary for the reasons I've mentioned. Um, the Conservative motion uh, mentions honoraria. <coughs> honoraria is a, is a payment made to an employee when they perform duties over and above their grade. Um, I've been in and around local government for many years. It is a, um, a very common uh, uh, mechanism, if you like, for, for dealing with that situation. <coughs> I don't accept the um, criticism that um, it's, it's not open and transparent because I'm sure that all payments made to senior officers are published as part of the transparency code on our website. And in respect of the Liberal Democrat um, motion, uh, or amendment, sorry Mr Mayor, uh, again um, I, I've made my comments about the Chief Executive's um, salary. Um, the, the increments that was referred to is we won't be paid until after the chief executive has been in post for a year and clearly we already have a well established performance appraisal system in place which the new chief executive will be subject to so for both um, for all those reasons mr mayor i'll be recommending to council that we um, ratify the uh, cabinet's recommendation and that we reject both amendments thank you mr mayor okay thank you Phil, and now we move on to Council of Green. We have up to seven minutes to speak to them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hopefully, we won't uh, take that long. Okay. The, the issue um, for me is several fold. First of all, um, this uh, item is coming back to the Council uh, to talk about the, uh, the remuneration uh, salary package for the Chief Executive, for the new Chief Executive. Mr. Mayor, if this isn't agreed tonight on the students, the new chief executive won't be able to start. Because this matter should have been made clear when the council took its vote on the chief executive at the last council. And it, it, it uh, never ceases to amaze me that the council could be uh, preparing these papers to uh, be so remiss that a matter as important as didn't actually get reported as it should have been at the last <coughs> council. I'm also disappointed, I did refer to it at the time, I'm sure uh, Phil will remember, that uh, the employment appointments committee weren't given the opportunity to agree what the salary, starting salary should be. Now I made a reference, uh, but it never came back to us to say, you as the employment appointments committee, you've appointed Eric as the new chief executive, this is the salary that we started on in order for that minute to come forward to full council. So again, uh, rather astonishingly, we're in a situation if this is not agreed tonight, then the chief executive, the future chief executive who thinks he's got a job, has in fact not got a job because council wouldn't have agreed the actual salary. And rather than 
be open and honest about that. So, hey, you know, guess what? We're all, uh, we've messed up. Let's just uh, clarify at the moment. The way, classic rural way, is for trying to help up. You all knew about that. You agreed the range, and this is all just part of the council pay policy state, rather than just being open and straightforward. Well, um, we've made our point around the salary, and we will continue to make the point around the salary. We believe that sort of level is too high. Then we come on, Mr. Mayor, because in order to try and get this out, out in the way that they did, they decided then to talk about the pay policy statements and to try and make the suggestions part of the pay policy statement. <coughs> um, at the same time, uh, happily, as uh, John Grace, um, who should be on for some sort of an award from the council for the scrutiny that he uh, that he applies to what the council does and doesn't do, finds the figure of six million pounds being paid in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, honoraria and, and, and bringing in uh, extra staff and so on and so forth. But in terms of honoraria now, I'm specifically interested in and looking at that and how it applies to the pay policy statement. It is referred to that we have an honoraria system and during my briefing um, I think uh, one of the senior officers there was able to walk through it and point out where it talks about referring to the honor honoraria policy. And so I asked to see those. But I actually looked at those and I recommend the film because I don't believe you would uh, necessarily agree with it if you had an opportunity to read it. Um, I would certainly wouldn't come back and say, well, I feel the council does it, so it must be all right. I believe that where there are opportunities for advancement, <coughs> so if somebody leaves and there is there a new role for somebody to move into, it should be done on the basis of open and fair competition, not as it is at the moment when you read those through, at the whim of the chief officer. Everything is down to the chief officer to pay whatever other area they think fit in any set of circumstances. And clearly, to me, there is a complete lack of transparency around how that is being operated. And it seems to me that that's why I've asked for this review, that that policy should be reviewed to ensure open and fair competition goes on. And we're not just promoting the mates. I'm sure no one would ever dream of doing that. But I think we need to be sure that there are clear policies in place to make sure that the right person gets the job as opposed to the person the chief officer may or may not think should get the job. And I think we need to, uh, we need to open that policy up. The other element within the policy in section 11 uh, is about re-employment and re-engagement of employees. Now, I was absolutely staggered to discover, but again, uh, I think we need to uh, thank John Brace for raising this as an issue and then it, it will uh, was further looked into. That we currently have uh, a person who left the council, took a voluntary redundancy, had a voluntary redundancy package of over £100,000, uh, very recently, who almost immediately, and I mean almost immediately, was re-engaged for £400 a day to carry out essential work, apparently essential work, that needed to be done. Now I have, don't take any particular issue with the individual, but if there was this particular uh, essential piece of work that needed to do it, why did we let them go in the first place? Why did we give? Uh, Council taxpayers' money, because that's who it is. Why do we give council taxpayers' money that amount and then bring that person back? And it seems to be, Mr. Mayor, that that is uh, this whole thing needs cleaning up and tidying up. And if we have policies, we should follow them. And if where our policies are not clear, open, and transparent, and being fair to all staff, we should put a process in place that is free, open, and fair. And one that we can all be proud of. At the moment, it is the so, same. Once again, the council mocks up on me as crucial and basic as the chief executive appointment and pay, and reporting that to council. Secondly, we have a process in terms of honorarium and acting up that is not open and fair when you actually.
we read it. And finally, we're not even following our own policy from what I can see about re employment and re engagement of employees. Mr. Mayor, I do hope the leader will look at this and take the relevant action to put in place procedures and policies that don't allow this to continue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, that's all on the Councillor Phil Gilchrist. You have about seven minutes to do your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't think I need seven minutes. You would like to look here. See Harry's on the white ball. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. What about the other In December, Mr. Mayor, as my colleagues and I raised our misgivings about having a salary range where the difference between the lowest paid officer, full time post, and the most senior officer was ten, more than ten times. That said, the appointment has been made at over 11 times that difference, and the panel did look at those issues, advertise the post, I understand that reasoning, but I'm not particularly happy with it. However, Mr. Mayor, <coughs> the minutes of the 8th of February of the employment panel that we had referred to the recommendation that Councillor Green seconded. And it recommended to council, we discussed it last time, and there was a minor rebellion amongst a few members, uh, and we appointed a particular head of service. But Mr. Mayor, the panel, another panel on the council talked about this issue of those increments on the 5,000 sum, and it still lies within us to express a view on that. I also note from the pay policy, and I'll what the leader was saying earlier was this, well, other councils claim that much more comparable authorities. The question I'd look at is whether those other councils have the raft, as I call it, the strategic directors, above directors, who are carrying out the functions that they lay down, and what the total bill for that whole sector is. However, that said, the panel on the 6th of February didn't go into the detail of salary, and it is a matter for council now, and I wish to raise those misgivings about them. <laughs> Before I forget, Mr. Mayor, I did have circulated a matter, a comment on a cabinet minute, which has been circulated by Mr. Tour, and I'm not sure at which point we'll come to that, and it doesn't wish it to be overlooked as we're talking about the cabinet for the 15th of January. But on this specific point, Mr. Mayor, in connection with the pay policy statement, there's an amendment there in my name to be seconded by Councillor Kelly, and we have our reservations about those increases. Just before we call for the speakers, your issue about your other amendment is being dealt with the item based on the matters for those. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that advice. So, are there any speakers? Or we go straight to seconders. Okay, are there any other speakers? So, we go to seconders. And the <coughs> next person I'm calling is the seconder for the Conservative amendments, which is Councillor Levy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, really, Labour are probably in their way surprised that we tonight to the paper of the statement um, because we, as Councillor Green is quite rightly said, we've been consistent all along in our opposition to the range and the level of um, salary identified for the new Chief Executive. Um, again, we've been consistent because we voted against the <coughs> levels at the recent Employment and Appointment Committees. Um, I don't think really, you know, members on this side of the chamber can still get their heads around the fact that how on earth can the salary for a Chief Executive of a local authority be more than the salary of the Prime Minister of the country. It certainly beggars belief, actually, and there's nothing really to raise the morale of our staff. And Mr. Mayor, there's still very much a lot wrong with this council. And a shining example of that just has to be the honorary policy board. Mr. Mayor, what the leader of the council seems quite proud and keen to swan around the country promoting accolades. Thank you. 
transparent and open in absolutely everything it does. Payments made under this policy certainly do not reflect a fair and open practice. Is this council simply operating a closed shop policy for many of its staff? And I certainly hope, as my leader alluded to, that that is not the case. Because at the same time, when thousands of town hall staff jobs have become redundant, how can this council operate a policy which spends £6 million in a short period of 10 months, £6 million of ta council taxpayers' money on agency and contract staff? And to add insult to injury, a council where a top council official is quoted as saying that this is best practice and cost effective. I can't get my head around that one either, and I'm sure residents can't either. A council which spends such an amount on non-frontline staff, and if it is correct, and I've no reason to suspect that it isn't, a council, as Jeff Green alluded to, who lets an officer go with a package of six-figure sum, and then within a week, I understand, that person returns to the council on some 